Emily, again, thank you very much for taking time out of your day to speak with us about question four on the 2024 Massachusetts ballot. Working on campaigns is not my you know, profession. I, uh, like I said before, I'm a Navy veteran. So I, um, you know, believe in this because it, it worked for me personally and for a lot of other people I know. I had to travel to Jamaica to get this treatment, um, but it's what turned my life around, right? So I had been having a really hard time for about seven years, and this is what changed the trajectory of my mental health. This sets up a regulated therapeutic framework. So like you said, this isn't like cannabis. You can't just go to a dispensary and buy mushrooms and walk home with them. Chris, once again, thank you very much for taking time out of your day to talk with us about another ballot question on the November ballot in Massachusetts. This time it's question four. As you stated, it, it stands a limited amount. Uh, but when you dig into the ballot question itself, it allows for 144 square feet of grow. And what is 144 square, square feet of grow? That's 12 foot by 12 foot. That's the average size of a bedroom here in Massachusetts. This ballot question also allows you to hand out uh, anything that you grow in excess to friends and family. So this is going to create a, a gray to black market vibe and, and, and other psychedelics. And one of the key reasons we're opposed. Now, opponents of question four contend that if this passes, it could result in the creation of either a gray or even a black market uh, for the psychedelic drugs and that costs for treatment could still be prohibitive for people who need it, people who need this treatment. How would you respond to both of those contentions? Yeah, so I'll touch on the decriminalization piece first. So Massachusetts already has eight cities and towns that have decriminalized or they've deprioritized. And what happens, right, if we keep these substances criminalized or we decriminalize without allowing for people to cultivate their own, it does create a black market, right? But what happens if we keep this decriminalized is people can't talk to their healthcare providers about it. And then they're making what could be just uninformed decisions about using these substances with their medications. It stays in the shadows and there's a huge stigma on it. Decriminalization is important for people to just be able to, and for providers to be able to talk to without fear of retribution because these substances are being used widely already and keeping them stigmatized isn't keeping anyone safer. Um, in terms of the cost, you know, yeah, cost is a big thing that we all think about and making this equitable and reachable is really important. Um, because at the end of the day, it is like 10 to 12 hours of care, right? If you were to spend 10 to 12 hours with a therapist or an acupuncturist or, you know, list anyone really, it's going to be about a thousand dollars, you know, give or take. Um, the solutions we have to that right now are, you know, scholarship based. Using this in a group setting is incredibly helpful. Um, that's how I came into it. Um, and that reduces cost. And the goal is eventually, right, to get this regulated, normalized, and covered by insurance eventually, but we have to take the steps to get there, and this is the first step. Proponents do contend that this could open the door for treatment that could benefit patients, like you had mentioned, veterans with PTSD, as well as uh, general people with mental health challenges, those uh, in end-of-life care. I wanted to give you a chance to rebuttal to that, because that's one of the major points that proponents of a yes vote uh, would be would be, would be be putting forth in, in regards to question four. We've seen them roll out uh, veterans and others that are in in absolute need of, of care. And they're, they're talking about hope. Well, let's talk about this hope. To hide behind veterans and say that this is geared to them, knowing full well the cost that this would put on people, that doesn't provide hope. That's false hope. This coalition is not advocating against the medicinal use of psilocybin and some of these other drugs. We're not arguing against that. We believe that more research needs to be done. We believe that research should be done by medical professionals. And we believe it should be done in a hospital. They know full well that this is not be possibly afforded by the vast majority of people here. The people that they're targeting are the ones that are so desperately in need to provide them with the false hope that this can come and help them, knowing they couldn't possibly afford it, is, is frankly disgusting. The Mass Psychiatric Society, when the State House uh, hosted hearings on this, they came out and said, this is a bad idea. They came out against it at a state house hearing. And when you talk to the legal community, the first responders, DAs, sheriffs, they haven't spoken to a single one yet that's supported. They, they truly believe this is the bad way to go. But as people are looking at question four, what would you want them to remember? One thing. I would want them to think about all the people they know in their life. And if they had run out of options, um, 
you know, what, and there was one more thing they could try if they try it. Because I think for a lot of people, that's what this is. Can you trust an organization that would hide behind the brave service men, men and women that are facing severe PTSD and, and other life-changing injuries looking for this? Would you trust them if they're hiding behind them and not telling you the truth about what actually does? That can't possibly afford it.